Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vadim. I work as an engineer at Datadog. Uh, let me read back. So I'll be talking about a service that we had been working for a year and a half uh, that replaced a different service. So a little bit about Datadog itself. We are a monitoring company. We provide monitoring for different things from hardware servers to databases, web servers. We collect application performance monitoring metrics, logs, and et cetera. And obviously we alert. But no worries, the talk is not going to be about Datadog at all. Um, this is like a little bit of content like that I'm going to go through. And first of all, for those who arrived in New York, welcome to New York. It's been waiting for you. <laughs> uh, back to serious problems. Uh, this is like a description of the data that we have. We capture like org IDs, metric IDs, some um, timestamps, values. And this goes through a certain map. Um, that distributes the payloads to top Kafka topics and partitions. So a certain metric will always go to a certain topic and partition. And from there, um, different uh, topics and partitions are consumed by a host or a single consumer, and then it, uh, this consumer writes data to different files, uh, one file per metric ID, and after that it encodes and compresses and writes custom binary files to S3 every X hours. <coughs> This whole system powers uh, historical metrics at Datadog. So once you go on dashboards uh, older than one day, you, the system is going to use uh, files produced by that system. Um, the problem with that original system is that one host has hard limit on the number of file descriptors, which is one million. So once we hit uh, one million of file descriptors, we have to split uh, topics and partitions across uh, new hosts and new consumers. And for that, we had to set uh, timestamps when new uh, must start consuming, old stop consuming, and so on. And this manual process is really prone to mistakes. Uh, the other problem is that once you have like a host uh, having like high CPU usage, you split it and you have a couple hosts that have like 50% utilization. And you're basically paying uh, extra money for some resources that you are not going to use until you ramp up like your topics and partitions. Uh, and the other problem is <clears throat> once you go to one partition per host uh, and you hit like one million of file descriptors, you basically have no room to upscale. And if your node dies, you have to start a new instance, reset Kafka offsets, replay data for the past X hours, and that's a huge uh, manual process. Um, the other part that is um, difficult is that it's difficult to predict like which org and metric is going to be big, so this system uh, creates some hot big topics and partitions which creates problems downstream. So uh, we decided to uh, create a new system that, a uh, new service that uh, automatically balances orgs and metrics across different topics and partitions, so each Kafka topic partition is equally sized. But that means that we now have to consume all the data and we don't know like in which exactly partition our metric, uh, metric is stored. So out of this, we got requirements to the new system. Conceptually, it must work with the new partitioning schema. It must be able to handle 10x growth. If we grow like twice, if we double our size of data every year, it must work for the next three years. Uh, we, got, we have to keep the cost at the same level as the existing system, which was a little bit tricky. Uh, and it must be as fast as the existing system, which is also tricky. Um, but besides conceptual uh, problems, uh, conceptual requirements, we had operational, mis uh, operational requirements. So the system must be easily scalable without much uh, manual intervention. It, uh, we should minimize impact on Kafka. We should reduce da data retention time. It should be a still be able to replay data easily in, in case we have some bug. Um, so at Datadog, before starting a new service, overall we always create a document outlining everything that we are going to implement, and then we request comments. And as you can see, this document was started in June, uh, a year and a half ago, pretty much, and we got some feedback and we discussed before even starting working on anything. Um, here is a quote from Taylor Swift. Swift sorry. Uh, we need to load all topics partitions to compose a single time series. Why not offload Kafka to somewhere and then load the whole data set with Spark? This is a really insightful quote, and we did exactly that. Um, so going back to the previous model uh, that we had, so as you can see, file descriptors, encoding and compressing and writing, 
And this part, uh, we have state and we have compute separate. So what we want to do is we want to store Kafka to some storage, which will be state, and then we want to load storage and do all the computations, which is compute. And the technologies that we decided to use is Kafka Connect and Spark. So Kafka Connect would just uh, get data from Kafka and store it to S3, and then S3 would load it as if we were reading Kafka. And uh, out of this uh, was born the name of the project, um, TLRS. So it tailors secondary resolution data in our files. So that's why we call it TLRS. Cool. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about Kafka Connect, but uh, basically it's a simple consumer that writes data to S3 uh, as is without any modifications every 10 minutes. And the goal is like to deliver data to S3 as fast as possible. Uh, on the graph, you can see that we write lots of files every 10 minutes. It, Kafka Connect is really easy to operate. We just need to update single config if we want to add new topics or remove some topics. If we change the number of partitions, it will handle everything automatically. Um, removing and adding workers is super easy. Kafka Connect rebalances itself. And because we write files every 10 minutes, we commit offsets every 10 minutes, it means that if we want to stop the system, it will only push back uh, us 10 minutes. So we can reduce Kafka retention. The other part that uh, was tricky about Kafka Connect is we had to fine tune memory and overall. So here you can see the process itself uses about 27 gigabytes uh, and the heap stays about 16, so about like 10 gigs is used for other off heap operations such as um, network IO, compression, decompression, and other parts, um, which you normally don't see if you just look at the heap. We also make sure that uh, our uh, nodes loaded. We don't have like idle workers, but overall, like uh, balancing workers is still unsolved problems. We write every 10 minutes a lot of data. Uh, I actually was told to remove y axis here, but it's in terabytes basically. Uh, so that's a lot of data, and because of that, we had to do a lot of optimizations. So we had to random, uh, randomize key prefixes to avoid having hot underlying S3 partitions. Uh, we know that AWS recently announced, like a year ago, that they solved this problem, and we actually thought that they solved. But it turns out they did not, and we had to implement randomization. Um, we implemented parallelized multi part uploads because our CPUs were mostly idle when we were just using single threaded uh, uploads. And we submitted pull requests to Confluent, but it was not yet accepted. Uh, we figured out like optimal size of buffers to avoid out of memory issues we, that we had before, without, uh, and we discovered them by monitoring the system. And we still have lots of uh, slowdown errors from S3, so we have exponential back off for that and we monitor retries. And here's like Taylor Swift points. Uh, this is like shows like the number of points we process. Um, the other part, uh, after like we solved the problem, uh, the part with uh, storage and saving the state, we had to load all this, uh, the whole Kafka basically for eight hours or even more in Spark. And there were lots of unknowns. Reading 10 trillion points is very difficult. You're gonna have lots of objects, so you need to somehow minimize garbage collection. You need to figure out how to utilize internal APIs of Spark to get, like, to squeeze all the juices out of Spark. Is it even possible with Spark? Like, I remember one of the first conversations with my team, man, uh, team lead, like, I was like, I don't know, like, maybe it's not possible. Uh, make it cost efficient. That's another part. Like, you can read like 10 trillion points, but at what cost, right? So, minimizing um, garbage collection, we had to reuse lots of objects. This is one of the examples that we d we've done. So, we allocate one megabyte byte buffer once we open a file. We keep decoding payloads, uh, we compress them using ZSTD into the allocated memory, so in one megabyte block. And then we get data from this same byte buffer. So, we only allocate it by buffer once and keep reusing it. Uh, the other part is uh, we use data frame API extensively because Spark allows you to uh, bypass completely uh, creating objects and Spark knows how to handle like its own internal memory representations. Um, but for that, uh, to be as close as possible to the data frames, we wanted to create a data frame compatible file format. 
Um, so we created it. It provides a reader of internal rows, and then this internal row points to the regions of memory in the allocated buffer uh, from previous slide. Um, so this is an example of like what it actually does. So this whole thing is uh, the code that Spark generated. So it, uh, for some stages, it generates code, Java code, and executes it. Um, so here you get an internal row, and then from this internal row, it gets integers from special specific positions. And inside our reader, we have just a single row, the same object. And then when somebody calls get integer, we know uh, field position, and we, then we just slide within the byte buffer and get everything. So here we avoided creating lots of objects, and we directly deliver primitives to the Spark internal memory. Uh, we did some profiling, which didn't help us much. To be honest, I don't actually remember what I was profiling on these screenshots, but I just threw them like we did it. <laughs> uh, here's an uh, after like we created the file format and, and we uh, replaced the previous method with data sets. As you can see, like uh, the task time overall is 700 uh, hours went down to 400, and the most important part is garbage collection uh, dropped like by three times. That's not, um, we, the other problem we had is that Kafka Connect sometimes creates really big files, bigger than two gigabytes, and in Spark, uh, in Java overall you cannot have by, uh, byte arrays bigger than two gigabytes, uh, and overall like if you try to read like 30 files of two gigabytes in memory, you're gonna use like 60 gigabytes, which is not great. So instead, what we do is we copy a file locally, and then we do some, uh, we uh, map it into the virtual memory using um, a library from Indeed. And then we allocate empty buffer, byte buffer using Java reflections, and then we point byte buffer to that region of memory inside the memory map file. And then we give this byte buffer to ZSTD to decompress, and everything thinks that it's just a byte buffer, but it's actually points to memory map file. So this is an example of some unsafe memory manipulations that we had to do in order to completely bypass creation of unnecessary objects and reading like two gigabyte files. Um, the other part is that some files re get really big, so when you have like multiple tasks running, some of them will be completely skewed. So instead of that, we wanted to, our file format to be splittable as well. So we set a split size of one gigabyte. So uh, multiple readers are gonna read like different parts of the file. And inside we write, inside the file we write length, payload, length, payload, length, length payload. So when a reader starts reading it, it has like start position and end position, and it keeps keeping payloads until it reaches the start byte. Super simple. And because of uh, lots of tricks uh, with allocation, deallocation of memory, we had to, uh, sorry, we had to uh, do, uh, we had to implement uh, fine-grained monitoring around that. So we track like how much memory we allocated, how much memory we deallocated, and as you can see here, we, our code is pretty efficient. So we only use like four gigabytes at max per each executor. The other part uh, that I was talking about using Spark internal APIs. <laughs> So you have data set map, it must create objects, it copies primitives from Spark memory, it has schema, which is great, it, ha it is type safe, which is also great, but it is slow because of the first two parts. What instead we do is we use query execution to RDD, which returns internal raw, but it, do it doesn't create objects, it's just a single internal raw, the same object. So it's pretty much the same trick we did in the beginning, but now we are reusing it like from uh, read inside. It doesn't copy primitives. It has no schema, which is not great at all. And it's not type safe, so you can shoot yourself in the leg. And internal row has direct access to Spark memory. So here is how we do it. So here we have uh, our data frame, we do some operations, and then once we create this data frame, we do query execution to RDD, we get internal row, and then we have to get fields using field indexes. So we had to do also lots of testing around that. Um, we did some also like um, settings to off heap. So as here as you can see at max we use about like 180 gigabytes, but the off heap itself is about like 60. So 120 gigabytes is used for lots of off heap operations. And we did testing. So here we only compare like garbage collection to task time. 
So these screenshots were taken at like a different time. But basically the first one, you can see like almost half of the execution time is spent on garbage collection. And once we enabled off heap, only like maybe a fourth, fifth. So everything is great. And this is a real production job, so here we load like 22 terabytes and task time is like a thousand and garbage collection only like 70, 60 hours, so only 6%. And in real world, uh, in actual, uh, on the real cluster we run multiple jobs and the garbage collection is even lower, it's like below 1%. So all those optimi optimizations led to um, removing like garbage collection basically. Oh, I'm sorry, coffee, water break. Ah. Thanks. Testing. Unit tests are boring. We have them. There's lots of references to Taylor Swift as well. Integration tests, we have them. Also like 1989. Um, staging environment, we have it. So I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, we did load testing, slowest parts, checking data correctness, and game days. So I'm going to be talking about those uh, parts. So load testing. Once we had a working prototype, we started uh, throwing more data at the, our job. So we threw like 10x more data and we checked like what parts are breaking, what are the slowest parts, et cetera, et cetera. And we were uh, estimating costs. So as we, our company grows, like how expensive um, is, go is it going to be linear, exponential, or something else? Slowest parts. We got to have, good, you always have to have good understanding of slowest parts of your job so you would know when it's gonna break, when you have to start optimizing it and so on. So knowing limits is really important. And we report lots of metrics about parts that we think are slow or fast. And we also have historical data so we compare like how stages become slower or faster. And this reporter also prints ASCII portrait of Taylor Swift every time we run it. Um, so after we ran the new system using all the data that we have, we did one to one join with previous system. So you have like 10 trillion points on one side and 10 trillion points on the other side, which was another problem to join. Um, but this allowed us to find some edge cases that we were able to eliminate. So out of like trillions of points, you see like less than 1% had a difference and we were like, why is that? And it turns out like when we were reading, um, we had to re recreate the same positions uh, of points. So you have like point with the same timestamp, but within Kafka topic, they were like scrambled. After eliminating this issue, we were able to completely eliminate, eliminate any differences, pretty much. Um, game days. Game days, are, for those that are not familiar, um, created to test your system how, uh, how resilient it is what is like limits and fault tolerance uh, and so on. So you come up with scenarios. So you, you kill a node, you kill the whole service. You make a node like slow or like different, like different, different scenarios. You um, list like expected results. You then run scenarios and you write down what happened. And then you summarize key lessons. So for example, here we were killing the whole nodes. We expected some things to happen. Some things happened, something didn't. Here's like we were like slowing down a node artificially. And out of this, uh, it all allowed us to figure out like, uh, do we need monitoring of certain parts? Do we need to invest like new tooling and so on? And also allowed us, uh, allowed other people to get familiar with the system overall. Sharding. Uh, once we confirmed that our prototype works using the whole volume of data, we decided to split the job into shards. So, uh, there were like multiple reasons. So we use spot instances, so losing a single job for a shard will not result in losing the whole progress. And if for some reason there is an edge case, it will only affect a single shard, so your job will, other jobs will pass, but this shard will be affected, so you can uh, limit the scope of your problem. And ability to process shards to completely separate, uh, on completely separate shards, uh, sorry, clusters. So sometimes like in your availability zone, you will not have, uh, available instances so you can start in a separate availability zone and process data from S3 because it's, it's multi uh, AZ replicated. Uh, so f before implementing sharding, we had to identify independent blocks of data. So in our case, it was simply uh, orgs. So because one org doesn't depend on other org, 
we were able to like split them completely. And on Kafka Connect side, we just have like config files that spreads them across like 64, 64 shared charts or if org is, a, is really big, we can move it to a separate chart. So, and because of, uh, we know a single job can process all the data that we have, and now we have a single shard that's like 64 times smaller, it means that our job overall, if we continue doubling data, it will work for the next like six years, and after which we can increase the number of shards. Um, after we did all the testing and all the preparations, we had to start like migrations. Uh, migrations is re are, are really difficult, so in order to replace existing system, we had to do multiple things. First of all, we wanted to run both systems alongside. We, we needed a release plan and a rollback, a rollback plan. Uh, we needed to make sure that systems that depend on our data can work with both new and old. And we, ha we wanted to also do partial migrations of customers. So if like new system is not producing like correct data, only a subset of customers will be affected. Uh, we needed to check everything underlying uh, pipelines and everything else. And finally, we had to do a final migration. So to run both system alongside, we wanted to run them as close as possible to production, same volume of data. We wanted to output in completely separate locations so nobody uses this data, but the whole system runs like as if, as if in production. Uh, we, make sure, we made sure that there's no discrepancies with existing data. Um, and we treated every incident as a real production incident, so there was like on-call rotation and everything, and we were writing postmortems as usual. But nobody was using our data, we were just like getting uh, familiar with the system. This approach allowed us to find bottlenecks that we previously didn't see or knew about. We figured it out like what kind of monitoring we were missing, and we got people familiar with this whole system and how to uh, operate it without affecting production. And yeah, we figured out some additional tooling that we needed. Um, release plans and rollback, rollback plans. For every important, uh, for every, pretty much every piece of the whole system and underlying system, we had, uh, deta we had really detailed plans how to deploy and how to roll back. As you can see on deploy here, we checked all the boxes and we didn't need rollback plan, luckily. <laughs> Um, so for dependent systems, we wanted to switch customers to the new system and back in case of problems. We wanted to, for dependent pipelines, to be able still to load both data sets and see like nothing happened. Uh, yeah, that's what I said. Oh, and we wanted to make sure that uh, if you have like a um, dependent pipeline running using new data, it will have the same output as if you were running it using old data. Partial migration of customers. It's very expensive to run both systems alongside when you have like system that burns like millions of dollars. You, and you want to run it like at least like six months, you're gonna burn a lot of money. So we wanted to just migrate like some customers. So we wanted to migrate our org so at, at Datadog, we use Datadog to monitor Datadog. We're one of the biggest customers of Datadog. <laughs> so <laughs> it was natural for us to like move us and see like, oh, hey, what's up? So we wanted to do it for a month, and then after a month, we wanted to move like a certain customer. Um, but the problem was like lots of, uh, lots of parts were not ready for that. So like r lots of parts didn't know that like there will be partial migrations. Usually like when you do migration, you do like swap, right? No, we had to like come up with like system that is gonna offer like a certain timestamp it will start, stop writing in the old system and then we'll start writing in the new system and so on. It was difficult to implement and maintain migration timestamps for each org. Um, certain things didn't have versioning so we had to add it. And for downstream pipelines, everything must look like nothing happened. So that w you, you're not gonna touch like every pipeline, you, have, you somehow have to create like some mechanism that's gonna work for that. Um, and we had to do lots of integration tests with migration timestamps. So the integration tests that we had helped us, and overall like for all the pipelines that we have, we have integration tests, so it was pretty, mu pretty easy to um, check if migration timestamps are gonna work. And after that, it was pretty easy. We picked a date, added additional integration test, tested on staging, rolled in production, 
we let the old system run for a week and we killed the old system and we cleaned up old code. Actually, we haven't cleaned up old code, but that's just future. Uh, results. So here's a comparison of the old system. So it was like everything storage, compute was everything in the inside the system. Uh, you can see Kafka Connect compute cost is 13%, S3 is 39%, so basically storing Kafka. <laughs> Uh, Spark is 77%, and if you summarize those numbers, you actually get number 129. So it's it's more expensive, which is understandable. Once you offload the state and load it, you will have to spend more compute resources. Right? You have to deserialize, serialize, send network, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But because we were able to remove a lot of data from Kafka, we in total we actually way cheaper than the old system. So we actually saved lots of money. And the speed. Um, so here you can see that we prepared data within like 10 hours. So we, 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 out, we will write files within 10 hours after like the point appeared. And here we had some outage. Life happens. Um, so results in high level. The new system works with the new partitioning schema. It handles 10x growth. It, we keep the cost at the same level as the existing system and actually cheaper. And it's as fast as the existing system. Operational. It scales uh, without much manual intervention. So Kafka Connect, we just add additional workers. On Spark side, side we just add additional executors. And S3, just Elastic Cloud, right? We minimize impact on Kafka. We reduce data retention in Kafka uh, a lot. Uh, and we actually store Kafka data in the suite longer, two times longer. So we actually increase retention in a sense. Um, we're still able to replay data easily. We actually had to replay Kafka Connect and Spark Jobs many times. And we actually had game, dames, game days where we were uh, replaying some Kafka Connect data. So we were sure that everything works. And here is a graph of PagerDuty incidents in hours. So the green one is the old system. The blue one is Kafka Connect, and the purple one is the Spark job. And we completely switched uh, old system in October. And as you can see, the old system had lots of lots of troubles. So overall, in, in terms of ops, we also won. And in conclusion, uh, what I want to reiterate is that documents and plans and RFCs are really helpful. Uh, we document a lot of uh, things. We discuss lots of things without like doing stuff, spending time. So that's definitely something that everybody should be doing. Uh, we did lots of testing, which helped us a lot. We did load tests, we did like integration tests, everything. Migrations are difficult. Unfortunately, I don't have like a like silver bullet for that. Like the migrations will always be difficult, I think. Um, there were many engineering obstacles that we were able to solve, albeit like some of like the methods that we use are really unconventional. And we were constantly monitoring, uh, we were constantly checking uh, our forecast about the cost and speed uh, new system. Because like if you build like expensive si new system, like you're probably not going in the right direction. So we actually were doing uh, forecasting estimates like every month while we were working for like a year and a half. Um, this is pretty much it. Uh, this is my work email, personal, Twitter, and Venmo, if somebody wants to send me. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and 